Modern Melbourne is a series of interviews that document the extraordinary lives and careers of some of our most important architects and designers, and looks at their lasting impact on Melbourne. Today, we speak with Phyllis Murphy. Phyllis was one of two female graduates of architecture in 1949 at the University of Melbourne. She launched a practice with her husband, John Murphy, and the firm quickly became known for their interpretation of modernist design. In 1952, the couple joined forces with Kevin Borland, Peter McIntyre and engineer Bill Irwin to design the Melbourne Olympic Swimming Stadium. The Murphy practice was also instrumental in setting up the National Trust in Victoria, and Phyllis is now recognised for her collection of and expertise in Victorian-era wallpaper. Can you tell me about your early interest in architecture? What, what put you on the path to going to university to study architecture? Well, I really don't know why I was interested, but always interested in buildings, even as a small girl. Always played with building blocks. Um, I was a bit unusual, I think. And I, I know my mother thought so because uh, I was probably only about 10, perhaps, and I read in the newspaper that the first escalator had been in, in Mel installed in Melbourne in the Manchester Unity building. So I begged her to take me into the city to see it, um, which she did, and uh, stood there at the bottom while I looked at it and went up and down. and. <laughs> was thoroughly fascinated by the whole thing. So I just don't know why that happened. <laughs> so your, your parents were really encouraging of your oh, move yes. into architecture? Well, my mother, um, I think, thought I was a bit strange, but was, she was a very good mother and <laughs> went along with me. But my father was very encouraging and he just said, oh, look, do what you like, you know, there's the world out there, mm. give it a go. You mentioned that your career counsellor at school said to not study architecture um, and instead study fine arts. Oh, my, the principal at school, yes, oh yes, um, most unsuitable for a girl, not the right thing to do, what else have you thought of? <laughs> So I said, oh, well, I thought anything to finish this conversation. And I said, oh, an arts degree. And so he said, yes, right, Phyllis, and put that in his book. And I went out the door and thought, well, that's what you think, not what I think. <laughs> so, um, hmm. And so you went and enrolled at what is now um, RMIT? Well, yes, it was called the Melbourne Technical College mm -hmm. then. And uh, I did, I went in and it was a little bit after the beginning of the year um, because I'd been uncertain sort of where to go or whether to join the armed services. I wasn't quite 18, but, um, and I went into the office and the enrolment officer said, um, oh, Phyllis, uh, you know, you." Parents quite happy about this? No, Miss Slater, he called me, Miss Slater. Parents quite happy about this? And I said, oh, yes, yes, look, I said, my father uh, found out what the fee was and has given, no, he didn't know what the fee was, so he's given me an open cheque signed and I just have to fill in the amount it'll cost. And, uh, oh, he said, yes, all right. <laughs> So, yes, so uh, it was no difficulty, but just surprise, I think. Mm. And so you had uh, a few years at, at um, RMIT? Yes, or? well, I'd, I did as much as I could, but then, of course, with the war years, the courses, uh, the university course had closed mm. and I couldn't do any more subjects, so I... I uh, worked in an architect's office for a couple of years and with Young and Freeman. Young and Freeman. Mm -hmm. Which I loved being there, it was very good. And actually, it's a splendid idea, in fact, to 
uh, work in an office like that halfway through your course it gives you a great amount of information and practice and um, it was most enjoyable. Are there any projects uh, from your time at Young and Freeman that you remember that stand out um, to you? Oh, well, of course, I wasn't fully qualified, so I didn't get the most responsible jobs. I did work a bit on hospital. They were doing hospital work, which was quite good. And uh, then some of their smaller housing jobs and... Yes, it was a variety, but it was a great experience. And by this stage, you've met John Murphy, your your um, husband, or well, soon to be husband, and also yes. partner in practice. Uh, I I I met him. Uh, well, I think I was doing. Um, I must have still been doing a couple of night classes, I think, and uh, I did meet John. Then he was just out of the army and actually it was just before the war finished but a lot of students were being repatriated at that stage and helped to start their training again and he come he'd been in um, new guinea and the middle east for three years uh, so after your time at young Freeman. You, you talked to me about the travel that you embarked on, I think, yes. with, your, with your parents. Your father had a posting overseas. That's right, yes. And uh, he said, um, oh, I'll uh, shout your trip over if you like. And I think he wanted me to be there with my mother because really, when you think she was really just a Victorian lady and I don't think she would have managed terribly well on her own. Um, so when I told John that I was going over to London, we might be there for quite a while, he said, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going too. Um, so he managed to get himself a berth, which was very difficult in that time because uh, it was a, a convert, a, been a boat that was used, I uh, think, as a troop ship. Um, they stopped at India and picked up a lot of the wives from uh, uh, India was then getting its independence. And, um, and the Davis Cup tennis team was on board and they, they all slept, had to move into the hold and sleep in hammocks. A very different life. And then he arrived in London before I did and told everybody that I'd chased him over. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, so uh, we had a lot of, a very good time in England. Mm. And how, how long were you in England for? Oh, I think it was six, seven months. Mm -hmm. Quite, and John uh, worked in London and uh, I went around with my mother and took her lots of places sightseeing. And I did apply for a job and I nearly took it, but then I felt I really had another role to play. Mm. Um, but then, uh, then John and I went to Sweden for a marvellous holiday, uh, looking at all the modernist buildings there. And that was an absolute eye-opener. Um, was so impressive living in um, war-torn London, which bombed out sites all over the place and lack of food and lots of cabbage and <laughs> dreadful things to eat. Um, it, we went to Sweden and it was all so sort of fresh and clean and unaffected by the war and a lot of the new buildings had such a sort of simple interiors and modest way of living that it really uh, impressed us greatly. Mm. Apart from the fact that we had lots of lovely food, which we'd been missing while we were in London. 
And then, so you, from there, you, you travelled back to Melbourne. Um, mm. And I think you said it was about six weeks of, of boat travel back, back to, to Australia um, to start yes. your practice. Oh, yes. Well, um, it was hard to get a berth back. And uh, my father had gone to uh, America and some parts of Europe that you could st- go to, because a lot of it you couldn't travel in then. Um, and we managed to get berths on a Swedish cargo boat, or ship, I should say, shouldn't I? Um, and it was a fascinating trip because we came back via America through Panama Canal, and then we went up the west coast of America, Los Angeles and San Francisco. My father left us, arranged for some money there in, so that we could stay ashore a bit because it probably took um, about two weeks of um, sailing up the, that coast. Mm, so that was very, that was a bit of a bonus on the way home. So coming back from Sweden and maybe not so much England, but Sweden really... Oh, yes, that touched a spot. It, yes, and you can see that in your, your early work in the practice. Well, I think so, um, because the, um, we, when we came back to Melbourne, we both enrolled in the uh, university degree course, which had opened again, and we had to do two years to finish, because... Some subjects um, weren't right that we'd already done, but we did that. Mm -hmm. And um, then after we graduated, we... um, Oh, well, we married immediately afterwards and started our practice. And that was the time that the ex-servicemen were all trying to get houses and borrowing their £2,750, which enabled you to build a house. I wonder what the equivalent is now. Yeah, yeah. Um, And it was, you weren't allowed to build more than 10 squares. And if you put a veranda on, that had to count at half the space, half the area. So it was very and very hard to design a house for a family of that size and with that amount of money, but quite hard, quite difficult. And there couldn't be any overruns. No, no, it just had to be done for the amount of money they had and that was that. And I think we did about somewhere around 30 of those little houses in the first five years up to 1955. Um, most of them have gone or they're, um, they've been renovated and added to beyond recognition or just a few are still there, but in good order, I'm pleased to say. Well, one in particular is the concrete house. Oh, yes. Well, the concrete house is... Um, that. We did this one quite nervous about it. We'd never done that, and it was all poured in situ. Um, But it was in very good order when I saw it perhaps 10 years ago. So from quite modest, uh, modernist houses for returning servicemen and the family, you then went on to win the Olympic Swimming Stadium competition, which is a a huge (laughs) difference in, in scale. Oh, well, we had had other work as well as the houses. You know, we did a couple of baby health centres and small office block and, you know, um, smallish work, but we had quite a variety of work as well as the houses just to keep us sane. <laughs> and then you formed a partnership with Peter McIntyre, Kevin Borland, 
and Bill Bill Irwin, Bill Irwin yes. the engineer, to to put in your bid for the competition. Yes. Um, and so, how did that partnership come about? Well, we were university friends. We didn't know Bill, but we knew Kevin and Peter, and we just decided to get together and give it a go. Um, and uh, yes, we we found we had already entered in for a competition for this, a stadium, which well, it was decided not to build it anyway, but, and we weren't very happy with our, our submission, and we decided we wanted to, you know, be more creative and more creative about the building itself, you know, and our approach to it. So we worked from our, our small office in Camberwell, which we started before, um, had to do most of it at night and weekends because your clients, we had quite a few clients and they get a bit impatient if you're too slow. Um, and then we got Bill Irwin and that was just the best thing we did. Not only that was he so creative and and reliable and helpful with the design, but it it taught uh, John and me a lesson really that you should always work very well with your engineers, that you can get such a lot from them. And architects don't always do that; they are always more inclined to tell the engineer what he ought to do. But in this case, you know, we, we gave Bill a free go to see if he could work out that um, shape of the building and that a structural system, which he did so well. So that was, um, it was quite an exciting time. And of course, we were running short of time to finish the drawings and the last one was the perspective, the beautiful drawing that John did. He sat up all night, didn't go to bed at all and did that drawing and then we handed the, um, our submission in, it had to be in I think by 10 o'clock the next morning, just before Christmas 1952 that would have been. Mm. Um, and then, of course, when we won it, we got so much publicity, our pictures on the front page of the newspapers, and, you know, it was... And, of course, having the Olympic Games here in Australia, um, I mean, that's been... The, lots of games have gone on since, but it was a very new thing then and very exciting. Mm. And you mentioned to me... Uh, that you hadn't really considered what would happen if you won. No, game. no, we didn't give a, th a thought to what we'd do if we won it. Uh, and then when we did, we decided that, um, John and I decided that we wanted to keep our own practice separate. And I think we were right because you don't just jump into long-term partnerships with people unless you've had a lot of uh, work, done a lot of work with them and, you know, worked out how you're going to operate. So we decided to keep our practice going and I dropped out from the pool partnership and John spent a lot of time with the others. And then when that was finished, we went, all went back to our own practices. So it, it worked very well. I've still got the little part agreement with the solicitor where I dropped out of the partnership and the others stayed on, you know. In the early stages of the competition, the media really wanted to talk to you because um, you were a very rare female architect. Yes, particularly the lady reporters. <laughs> oh yes, I know it was a bit. That was a bit tedious, actually. <laughs> but um, they did. Yes, they made quite a fuss of me because I was an architect and a woman, which was unusual. 
Well, you were one of two uh, female graduates in your year out of, yes. um, and there were 80. Two women out of 80, and I graduated, yes. Looking back, do you feel that um, being a female ever, female architect ever um, meant that you were kind of held back or, or disrespected on site? Do you, did you contemplate that at the time? Or? Oh, I don't know. I, um, I quite enjoyed it. I fitted in. And of course, um, John and I were very much of an item then, so that was a lot of support, you know. I realised looking back. Um, and uh, all through the practice, I mean, it was. And of course, um, I had my name was in the firm name, which is very unusual. Mm. I've thought about it since, and a number of women architects, perhaps coming a little later than I, um, they worked with their husbands, but the practice was always in the husband's name. Was ours was John and Phyllis Murphy, mm -hmm. or when we incorporated John and Phyllis Murphy Proprietary Limited, and so there I was, and I was accepted without question, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think I was rather fortunate. Mm. And that would probably be uh, one of the most important things that John sort of gave you in your practice as an architect is that that equal support or respect? Oh, very much so, yes. Well, I said, said to someone not long ago, I was really lucky because I married a lovely husband who was an architect. So, uh, yes, that was good. Yes. Uh, so along with a very busy practice, you then got involved in the, the early stages of the National Trust. Oh, yes, we did well. It was uh, Robin Boyd who suggested that we should join the National Trust. And today, no one would realise just how interesting, how exciting, how new the whole concept was, because there was no heritage work being done before the late 1950s. And we joined and we became very interested and we were honorary architects for more than the next 10 years until such time as we felt we couldn't really do it anymore and, uh, and the trust was by then paying architects and employing them in a professional way which was much better and the right thing to do. So we did... Uh, looked after some of the early work that the Trust was involved in and um, knew nothing about conservation work, had to learn as we went along. Our rule was um, if you could leave anything and not alter it, you left it alone. You only uh, dealt with things that were absolutely necessary, you know, for structural reasons and that sort of thing. And we, um, they were not grand buildings, but they're all very interesting, very important in the history of our colonial life. Um, one I can think of is the Castle Main Market, where the outside walls were leaning out. One was very um, off vertical, it was leaning out and it become disconnected to the roof trusses and panel by panel we moved um, that back into place and it's now, you know, well it's had further work done on which was needed over the years but it's now quite sound and an important um, indication of, you know, the gold mining era in central Victoria. Um, and then there were some little houses, like uh, Governor Latrobe's cottage, which only half of it was there, of course. Mm. So we moved the half that was there, and then we ha managed to rebuild the rest because of the number of 
drawings and paintings that were available that showed us and it's a prefabricated building so of course if you got a full panel and then you got a picture of the building you could uh, work out all its dimensions and so on and that um, yes we became very interested in that sort of work and over the years it led us to commissioned work which was some um, heritage work too. We enjoyed that. Did your colleagues in architecture wonder why you moved away from championing modest modernism to um, to more of a to more yes, conservation work? People do um, ask me that and say how could you have been a modernist architect and then become so interested in heritage work but I think that's quite a narrow-minded way to look at it because if you're interested in buildings, you're interested in any building and you're interested in its quality and you're interested in how it functions and the external appearance is just one part of the whole um, design, really. And that's how I feel. And even today, I, I can be interested in all sorts of different buildings. Although sometimes I feel today's building technique, it may not lend itself to long life always. And that, I, f I think that's rather a pity because I think the built environment some of it should always stay so that we know where we've come from and then you know where you're going, you know. You mentioned Robin Boyd before. He, he encouraged you to join the National Trust. Can yes. you tell me about your relationship with Robin? Um, oh, we, <coughs> we knew Robin quite well. This was actually... Um, oh in the 1940s, before we were qualified, before, before we'd gone to London. We used to often uh, see him and Patricia, um, sometimes go on a little bit of a jaunt around looking at a few old buildings. Um, because I think Robin, although that's not generally known, but I think he had a great interest in all buildings as we did, not just, not just the one that was going on that <laughs> now. Oh, that's right, when he won the Hodden, Haddon Scholarship, uh, we looked after the jobs that he had going. We did the supervision of them for him. Um, later on, we tended to go in different directions a bit. Perhaps our horses and wallpaper were not a special interest, you know. You, um, you mentioned a story about uh, a dinner that you were invited to where Walter Gropius came and he knew about some of your projects. Oh yes, that's right. Uh, it was a lunch, yes, at Robin's. And um, <laughs> he... He complimented us on our little modernist houses and said that they had a quite distinctive um, Australian character. And uh, Roy Grounds got rather uppity then. He was with us at the time and said, well, now, don't you get swelled heads over that? <laughs> Yes, but... Um... During the work that you were doing with the National Trust, you started to build up a really impressive collection and knowledge about uh, wallpaper. Can you tell me about, about oh, that yeah. work? Yes. Well, when we were about to retire, uh, we were looking to buy a house in the Canton area having, and having lunch with some friends up there and they were asking us about some of our um, conservation work. And um, the hostess said, oh, she said, you'd be interested for this. Uh, there's a shed full of old wallpaper here. 
and I think it's going to the tip unless somebody wants it. And it turned out that it had been the premises of a painter and decorator who began in the 1850, late 1850s. The shed was to be demolished to make a car park and nobody wanted all these wallpapers, but the family was rather upset that they might be disappearing because there are part roles and all sorts of interesting things. And of course, I said, oh, how fascinating. And she said, oh, well, I could arrange for you to have a look if you like. So um, that took place and we ended up, um, it was a deceased estate and uh, John, I was speechless, you know, I could hardly believe my eyes and, and it was just a bit of fun, a sort of um, retirement thing, you know, I had lots of time to spare then and, and uh, he said, well, let's um, get on to the executive of the estate and see if we can get the collection. So we did that and, and uh, I ended up with hundreds of part rolls of wallpaper that I knew nothing about. I was extremely ignorant. I had the idea that every Victorian interior was dark and gloomy. And when I saw the colour in these marvellous papers, and some of them hand-blocked and really beautiful, um, I, I started to research the subject and became very interested in it. And I've um, written a few uh, pieces for an English magazine, and I do get uh, have contact sometimes with overseas people who want to know what we used in Australia and and the use of wallpaper was so extensive I couldn't believe it you know and even when I uh, started finding out more about them and people um, gave me samples you know I was in a wonderful place to collect because I got a lot of from that area and um, I found, you know, these little old farmhouses that were lined with hessian and then had a beautiful flock wallpaper inside and realised how much it meant to live um, in this strange new country for those people who came from England and Europe and out in the back blocks and yet they still wanted to keep up their standards and have a lovely home. Um, so I learnt a great deal and I've had a lot of pleasure from it and uh, I, I still get asked now and again to identify papers and sometimes I've scraped them off the walls of buildings that are going to be renovated and, men, and I keep them all, those ones all in mylar enclosures so they're safe and sound for posterity. And it's still an interest for me now. You mentioned that John also took an interest oh, yes, in retirement. Well, course, yeah. um, he had Parkinson's disease for about 20 years and I cared for him. Um, towards the end it was quite difficult and he it was something that interested him too because he used to sit with me when I was um, doing my untrained conservation work I, I read up a lot about it and you know I make my own paste and use my own um, non-toxic tissue paper at the back of the papers and when I'd scraped off a lot of fragments sometimes I could put them together and get the full design and uh, so he'd sit with me and he was always quite interested in it when really he wasn't up to much conversation then and um, not very interested to look at the television all day so that was a wonderful 
assistance to us. And it was great for me because I could do something for, that he enjoyed, but it was a benefit to me too. And I think as a carer, you need that. So it's been wonderful and um, I still uh, read a lot and I've actually just started writing another little article the other day. So, um, yes. So thinking back on, on your career, would the work with the National Trust be something that you're most proud of or is it earlier work? Are there any projects that come to mind that you're, that you're most proud of? Well... You know, I think an architect's role is one of great responsibility and uh, I think of it almost as um, a service, really. And I hope that, um, that our work was well done and that we did satisfy the requirements and that they looked well. And that's all I really wanted. I don't feel that any was so very much more important than others, large or small. Thank you, Phyllis. It's been absolutely delightful speaking to you today. Oh, it was a pleasure, and I enjoyed thinking back over my life. <laughs> <laughs>